the idea, so if you just kind of think about that, a uh, work of art is something new in the world that changes the world to allow itself to exist. Um, what that means is that the context you're making something in, the world itself is different when you start and when you end. So you're not just going from point A to point B, kind of within a, a static known world. You're in the point A world, figuring out how to lead from questions and risk developing things that are kind of unknown as to whether they'll succeed or fail. And that if they succeed, you have created a point B world. You've made something that then changes the world to make space for itself um, in, in a very small or a large way. These don't have to all be grand gestures, just kind of acts of um, you know, putting a dent in the universe, as, as the saying goes, of, of trying to kind of affect affect change or show up in a way of consequence in your personal life and your professional life kind of in the world in general. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Amy, welcome to The Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Hi, Srini. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, it is really cool to have you here. You know, I came across your story by way of Eric Fabian, who was one of our former guests here. And he told me a little bit about what you were up to and, and you know, what you're working on, the work you've done. I was like, yeah, that sounds definitely like the kinds of thing that is right up our alley. So um, I want to start with a question that has been really eye-opening and interesting to ask. Uh, and that is, what birth order were you? And what role did that have on you know your career and your life and on the choices that you made? Um, well, first, Rini, I just want to say I'm so happy to have come across the Unmistakable Creative through Eric Fabian, and I've loved getting to read your book um, in its galley form. It makes me actually want to try out surfing, which <laughs> I haven't done, so thanks for that. Um, so as to birth order, I'm definitely one of these people where if you spent like 10 minutes with me, you'd be like, hmm, you don't happen to be a middle child, do you? Um, and in fact, I am. So I have a brother who's three years older and a sister who's four years younger. And uh, when I was a baby, um, I was apparently this really, really quiet kid with big brown eyes and kind of bobble-headed. And I like to play with a strand of broken pearls. And I didn't crawl. I like was one of those kids who crab walked and didn't really say a lot. And I think my parents were sort of like, you know, we'll love her no matter what. But they were definitely like a bit a bit unsure as to how I would kind of show up in the world. And um, I think, you know, birth order is such a great first question because the older I get, the more I feel like it kind of governs how, how you kind of show up in, in so many different situations. Um, it makes me kind of um, naturally diplomatic. And I think middle children always care about fairness and a sense of justice because you're always kind of juggling space. You're not the oldest. You're not the youngest. Um, and in my case, I'm super lucky in my siblings. I have a kind of hilarious uh, younger sister and a very kind of um, dutiful, gracious, protective older brother. Um, but I don't know if you have siblings, Srini. Yeah, but I do. Yeah? Do yeah. you have brothers and sisters? I have a uh, younger sister. Yeah, I think it's it's um it's really fun because it's sort of like those times in life like when you get a college roommate where there's someone who's really different from you but you have this kind of commonality of like knowing that you're spending a lot of time and space together and that they're there kind of permanently and so we're a little bit of a trifecta like we we're all really different and um like have really different strengths and that's sort of fun. And I actually feel kind of lucky to um, have a brother who only has sisters because he was like, all right, I guess you guys are going to toss a football with me so I can, uh, well, I'm rusty, but I can throw a spiral. And um, like I used to think the line of scrimmage was painted on the football field and I do know where it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what impact did that have uh, in terms of the career choices that you've made and, and you know, what you've ended up doing with your work? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's such a good question because I think um, I've always been a person who is a synthesizer by nature. So there's some people who just take a deep dive into what they're working on. And I've always been one of these people who's 
thinking about how to make sense of things that are kind of different from one another or trying to find connections. And I think, you know, part of that definitely comes from, from, um, birth order, I guess. And also, and this is in the first chapter of my book, our parents were kind of in these far-flung fields of thought because our father was a scientist and our mother is a medievalist by background, like loves her Chaucer and her Beowulf. Um, And so we were always kind of like making sense of lots of different things at the same time. Um, You know, in terms of my career choices, I, I feel like I'm one of those people with a little bit of a found object career. Like, I was interested in so many different things. And at some point, I, you know, I worked in art museums, and then I got an MBA to be a museum manager. And then through a kind of series of personal circumstances, I took this plunge and got an MFA in painting right after that. And then that was the sort of found object moment where I was like, hmm, like, actually, I've put a foot in these two really different worlds. So now I have to think about how they come together. And Srini, just to your original question, I think a lot of that does come from my uh, middle child nature because, you know, I, I look like I have these two hats, art and business, but I really have a third hat, which is like a political science hat, which is like figuring out how things go together and the boundaries between things. And, and I actually feel like part of why I love studying and writing about art and business and teaching in both directions is that so many people are radically disenfranchised from one of those conversations or the other. There's so many people who are in creative fields who feel a bit cut off from talking about the market. Like they don't have an entry point that allows them to not be a business person, but a person who understands business. And then on the flip side, there's so many people who are incredibly gifted and and, excel at business and organizational form um, who probably feel a bit cut off from their creative sides. And so it's fun for me to kind of see people uncover either of those. Hmm. Okay, so that actually makes a perfect setup for the next question. You mentioned you have an MBA MBA and an MFA, and I I knew this. I mean, this is part of what drew me into your story was you have this really sort of unusual blend where there's an intersection of both art and commerce in your work. So I'm curious um, what you learn from the MFA that applies to the MBA type work that you do and vice versa? Yeah, no, I I think about this a lot because I uh, work with this guy in Taiwan who is starting a company and has a background in physics, went to physics grad school. And he said that the one true thing he learned studying physics is how to reason anything from first principles. And he was like, you know, what did you learn in business school or art school? Like, what's the one thing that you learn? And art school, I feel like the one thing I learned was a form of showing up, um, a form of committing to some kind of project without a lot of visibility on how it would actually go in the studio, and then just showing up. Um, There's this idea in the book about the difference between standing at an easel painting and sitting in the armchair in the studio, kind of checking it out or having a break. And I feel like being in art school taught me just to be able to stay at the easel, like to be able to just stay with the work. And sometimes you do that and you kind of dive all the way into it and then you hit a point where you realize that actually you have to scrap what you've been working on and to start over. And it was really fun to learn that. I think it was, it was also really fun to um, like become elastic and expansive about my own sense of judgment toward my own work and other people's. Because you just can't imagine the variety of things people are doing in art school. You know, there's a guy who's making a fun fur hut that's deeply conceptually rooted. There's a guy who's making... Um, photorealist oil paintings on canvas that look like Microsoft Word 97 desktops. There's someone who's stitching pieces of fruit together. Um, There's someone who's a beautiful watercolorist who, after I started teaching business lectures in art school and kind of using um, the Financial Times taped to my paintings as a blackboard, started mixing this kind of salmon pink color to work into her pictures. I mean, there's just such variety. There's a lot of this kind of healthy live and let live sense of kind of everyone's defining a project on their own terms. And you want to be kind of helpful and critical um, for people who are trying to discern how to move forward in a work, but it's not really your job to 
have a categorical judgment about whether something's good or bad. And I, I find that that for me is a really healthy way just to be in the world um, where it allows you to be rigorous and generous at the same time and to, you know, to aspire to let everybody make a contribution on their own terms, but to help each other make the best contribution that you can. Um, and, I, and I would say just to answer the flip side of your question about business school, um, when I was there, I was learning so many interesting things about how to be quantitative. Um, and then once I learned how to be quantitative, like how to run these huge Excel spreadsheets and um, build models, I also learned, you know, how much imagination and story is actually um, contained within those spreadsheets that, you know, in any massive model, there's at least one number that's completely made up. It's, it's made up based on a story. It's, you know, an assessment of risk or the risk-free rate or the hurdle rate, or whatever it is, um, but that there's this kind of like beautiful human quality inside them, um, and that uh, I would say business school taught me um, two different main things, and one is how to make decisions based on limited information, like how to own the need to make a decision in the moment without having a kind of full scholarly uh, chance to research every possible avenue or you know, without a, an ability to kind of crystal ball gaze into the future. Um, and then it also taught me to think in terms of opportunity cost, um, you know, imagining um, the cost of your next best alternative, which makes you a terribly, annoyingly impatient person when you're waiting on hold on the phone or in line somewhere. Um, but it's still a kind of nice way to go through life because you're, you're thinking about kind of optimizing for not just what's present, but what's absent at the same time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and one of the things I, I love doing now is is teaching business itself as a creative practice. So a lot of what I do is teaching business as if it's an artistic medium that you can build things out of. So I always say there are these two forms of creativity. There's writing the letter and designing the envelope, and the letter is the work itself, and the envelope is the container, you know, the business model or the day job. Um, whatever it is that allows you to do the work itself. And so I think it's a lot of fun and it's very inspiring for me to see people who are envelope builders, who are figuring out these kind of um, acrobatic, elegant business models to make things possible. Mm. You know, <clears throat> part of what prompted that question, uh, and I, I'd really love to hear your insight on this, you know, I think it was an article on Fast Company that said, you know, it was either the question, is the MF MFA the new MBA? And, you know, I look at it now, and I'm like, huh, might have been better off going to get an MFA than an MBA, <laughs> given what I'm doing. Uh, so I, I'm really curious to kind of hear your perspective and your thoughts on, on that sort of, you know, like, how true that is, and especially from the perspective of somebody who is an educator. Yeah, so I think it's a really funny question. Um Srini, I'm starting to hear feedback. Are you hearing that on your I'm end? I'm not, actually. Okay, then it's fine. Okay. Uh, so it was kind of funny for me because those articles first started coming out when I was in art school. So I had an MBA. I owned a gray interview suit that was not a costume. I was making relatively traditional oil paintings. And um, I was reading in the Harvard Business Review and Daniel Pink said in 2004, the MFA is the new MBA. And James Kramer, Jim Kramer said something similar the same year um, that all analysts should get fine art degrees so that they could spot undervalued AT&T stock before everybody else. And I have to say, I, I mean, I love the sentiment. It spoke to my um, deep desire for narrative coherence at that point, because I, I felt like I was like in a precarious situation, like in that game of twister, you know, where you can have like an arm on one side and a leg on the other side of the board. I felt, you know, a, as if my identity were stretched in this very incoherent way. Um, but I actually feel like, you know, th maybe there's a tiny bit of truth in that statement, or it's provocative in a way that's useful for the larger conversation. But I feel like there's something that's transcendently helpful about an MBA because it makes you a pattern recognizer and it lets you apply templates to problems. And then it gives you these quantitative skills to build things, right, and to analyze things. Um, but what's so interesting about art is that it, it's patternless and that it, it, it represents this kind of frontier space and this is one of the main ideas from the art thinking book, but it represents this idea not of going from A to B, you know, efficiently and quickly, 
but inventing point B. And so I just, I can't describe to you how much art school was just not boring. Like it was never boring. It was never the same. Um, you would go in one day, I, uh, the Slade is where I went to art school. It's part of the University College London. And the the main Slade building is in the, the main quadrangle of the UCL. And it's actually the part of the building, I'm pretty sure, where Sir William Ramsey uh, discovered the noble gases in a chemistry lab. And you walk in and there's this grand marble staircase that goes up the middle and then it splits to the sides. And I remember walking up it one day and I got to the top and I looked down and there was this bright yellow banana sitting there. And on the banana, someone had written on the peel in this blue ballpoint pen, please put me in your ass. And I was like, you know, that just did not happen to me in business school at all. Like that, um, or you'd show up to the studio. Our, our painting studios were in this different building down the road that was this kind of labyrinthine maze on top of a think tank called the Warburg Institute where you'd walk through. And I remember seeing this um, lovely guy, uh, Nick Brown, who was painting in a three-piece kind of morning suit, pinstriped, at about 8.30 in the morning. And I'm like, hey, Nick, how's it going? And it, I was like, what, what's with the outfit? And he's like, oh, I, I've just come in, actually. I was at this really interesting, um, you know, burlesque performance club, and I'd be happy to give you the details. You know, you don't want to miss it. And I just thought I'd come straight into the studio. And and I just feel like there is so much um, individuality and personality. So kind of from a from a pedagogical standpoint, I feel like these are the things you're always toggling between. You're always toggling between how to give people the tools that they need and the context for what's already known so that you're informed about um, history and what I would call best practice. Um, But then also how to invite people to show up to that with their authentic, independent thinking selves. Like how to um, be able to see it and not just receive it as wisdom and how to kind of nimbly embrace their own skepticism and their own creativity toward it. So I think you're always kind of actually combining those things. And there's a lot of discipline on one side and a lot of imagination on the other. And then sometimes those actually flip roles where, you know, there's just as much discipline on the art side. You're stretching and sanding and stretching and sanding a canvas. And there's just as much imagination on the business side where you're trying to come up with, you know, a new idea or a novel way of getting a product to market. So before we get into the idea of inventing point B, I want to um, ask you one more question about something from the earlier part of your story. Uh, You know, for people listening, you may not know this is the third time Amy and I have attempted this. <laughs> uh, you know, last time you, we we actually talked about something that really caught my attention, which was uh, you were a Suzuki violin student. Uh, That's right. And you know what you said to me about it struck me so much. I wanted to make sure that we got back to it again. So, um, you know, f- first, sort of, you know, give us the background on it. But what I'm really curious is, you know, what are the lessons that you took away from that that have later applied in your life? Yeah. So, I mean, I think radical transparency about the creative process is a big theme in my life and in the book. So let me just say, this is probably the fifth time I've been lucky to talk to Srini on the phone. And we did have a super interesting conversation and then a tech failure on the recording device. So it is my pleasure to get to talk to Srini again. Um, And I I was joking with him before that, uh, Srini, joking with you that um, you know, if I had been upset by the tech failure, I'd be like a little bit full of it with regard to my whole writing project because that kind of thing where things go a little bit messy in the middle area is that's just endemic to trying to do anything untemplated and open ended in life in general. So, um, Srini, uh, was asking me, you were asking me the first time we talked about um, my childhood, and I have to set the stage a little bit, which is that um, despite the tragic loss of my Southern accent, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Actually, one of the coroners, when Elvis Presley passed away, lived on the street from us. We used to trick-or-treat at his house, and it was kind of idyllic. Um, Our House number was 1576, which I mentioned because when the uh, 1976 kind of bicentennial celebration happened, my mother was like out there on the front step in these plaid bell-bottom trousers, 
helping all of us put crepe paper in the wheels of our bicycles so that we could ride up and down the street while our next door neighbors sang um, America the Beautiful on their steps. I mean, you just can't imagine kind of total childhood of the 70s, like, um, you know, you're sent out onto the street in the morning and you come back at night at dusk and um, you know the boundaries, but you're kind of a free range kid inside that. So that was the sort of like, you know, please don't play with glass shards and plastic bags, part of my 1970s to 80s childhood. But the other part of it was that there were a few kind of select house rules. And um, a lot of them had to do with the fact that we all played Suzuki violin. So um, my brother started playing when he was about six. And the way it works when you start playing Suzuki violin, as maybe many of your listeners already know, is that they give you a butter box. So they give you literally uh, the square kind of butter box where four um, like logs of butter, sticks of butter sit all next to each other. And they tape a ruler to it, a wooden ruler. So it's kind of shaped like a violin. And your main first job is to learn not to drop it. Um, My mother sewed me a case for it, which was so nice of her. And I, I am really slow when I'm learning anything. Um, I'm one of these derive the equation people where I kind of have to wrap my mind around the whole of it, which is a polite way of saying I look like a complete idiot a lot of the time when I'm first starting something. Um, Learning to drive a car is a standout example of that. Like I actually um, drove over a curb and got a flat tire and returned home without the car the day I got my learner's permit and had already at that point confused the brake and the gas and stomped it, as my brother says, into this mound of rocks with a basketball goal in our driveway. So I just, like, I, and now I love to drive. I think it's so interesting and you see everything. Um, but violin was really similar for me. It took me like a week, I mean, a year to learn how to play Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And we played, there's a big violin community in Memphis, and we played with these just unbelievable people who were, you know, in the local symphony in high school. And I still remember, I was saying this to you before, Srini, that uh, we would go see these performances where there were all these um, Japanese children who were about four years old who were playing the Bach double, which is a really complicated piece to play. I mean, I, I maybe could play it when I was like nine or 10, but I was also playing violin for a, a long time by then. Um, so am I kind of like working theory of parenting based on violin is that you should always give your children something to rebel against that's not that serious so they don't get into worse trouble because I just cannot describe to you how much time we spent as children trying to get out of practicing the violin. Um, we were, we were also trying to watch television and to eat cookie dough, which my mother always left in the refrigerator. And there's a little bit of a game theory lens there because when you're one of three, uh, you can always kind of deny culpability all around. If you're one of two, it's much easier to say the other person did it and kind of prisoner's dilemma game style. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I did practice, I mean, somewhat, uh, but, um, But I always joke that the person who was most adept at getting out of playing the violin was my brother because I think he broke his arm like four times when we were children. Not the same arm every time because that's really the only way that you can definitely get out of playing the violin. Um, But I went to camp for four weeks one summer and my mother made me take my violin with me. I think I played like once a week. This woman came over from a local music festival and gave me lessons and the bridge on my violin warped. Um, But otherwise, I I spent a lot of time, you know, faking my way through second violin parts. And I actually did sleep through the standing ovation at the end of an Itzhak Perlman concert once. I remember waking up disoriented in this bright orange auditorium of of the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s. And, um, you know, most of the seats were empty. Um, So I I think um, the reason we were talking about it is that on the one hand, I feel really lucky that it gave me an ear for music and an appreciation the same way that playing a sport allows you to more fully uh, appreciate watching someone who plays it so expertly that they're making it look easy. Um, And we were talking about it because Srini, um, more nobly than me, um, you are someone who I think practiced quite a lot when you were a kid, right? Yeah, religiously. (laughs) <laughs> Wait, what were you practicing? The tuba, much to the dismay of my family. <laughs> <laughs> that was really funny. I mean, it's better than the recorder, I think. Um, but so did you, like, did you just practice all the time every day? 
Yeah, pretty much. I mean, three hours a day. I, I got good, like enough to get into the USC School of Music. And uh, that just, you know, was one of those things that wasn't meant to be, though, as a career. Wow. That's a, like, it's a little bit of an Olympic athlete kind of story where you, you know, you tear your ACL or something. Yeah. Well, I just, the funny thing is the discipline from that still impacts me to this day. Like I realize now, you know, almost 30 years later as a writer, that is something that has made its way into my work. Like that's how I learned how to consistently do something. Right. I mean, it's interesting because I feel like when you said it, I was like, gosh, maybe I, you know, don't, don't work hard enough. But, um, what we were talking about is that like, there's a, I like to think that you you can have a kind of rigor and discipline that's attached to one area and you, you know, religiously play the tuba. I'd also like to think that you can have a rigor and discipline that occurs episodically. And maybe this is true for artists where, you know, you dive into a body of work and you play all the way through and then you dive into another because I'm, I've always been a little bit of a jack of all trades kind of person and child of extremely specialist parents. So my parents were much more like you and the, the tuba playing. And um, I always remember uh, our dad worked all the time when we were kids. He's a, he was a medical researcher and a doctor and he was just constantly, you know, at his desk and conspicuously not sleeping a lot. Um, and our aunt, who is a really gifted uh, retired professor, she worked a lot too, but the family joke was that my dad always looked like he was working and she never looked like she was working, but she got so much done. And I feel like I'm a little bit more like her where I'm running around or I'll duck out for coffee at three in the afternoon if I have a friend who's visiting from the West Coast. Um, but uh, within that flexibility, there's a kind of there's a commitment, but it's a different kind of commitment. And I'd like to think that there's something more general that comes from that that's um, kind of about what I would call the connective tissue in the body of knowledge or this idea that, you know, there are pe- in, in, in our kind of collective body, kind of figuratively speaking, you know, there are people who are specialized in all these different areas. And then there are others of us who kind of are, are travelers who move around and connect things and um, get to make sense of them later by accumulating this kind of Venn diagram mentally of different areas. Um, but I, I think it's amazing, Srini, to have that in your background. I, I hugely admire uh, people who've had some form of kind of childhood experience like that, you know, whether it's athletic or musical. I just wasn't like that. I mean, I, I definitely dove into things like I remember taking this kind of seventh grade science class and spending like the kind of blissful days that are actually hard work, um, learning all the names for all the parts of the human body and studying and studying kind of for pleasure. Um, but I, I didn't, you know, become a doctor from that. I, I guess I, um, kind of moved around for a while trying to figure out, um, what, what to do. Today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by Audible. So you know when a book just completely hooks you and you can't put it down? Well, with Audible, you don't have to. You can discover where Audible audiobooks can take you. I signed up with Audible just a few weeks ago, and I'm currently listening to Broadcasting Happiness by former unmistakable creative guest Michelle Galen. In fact, sometimes I tend to buy both the audio and the physical versions of a book because when you listen to something you've read, it actually reinforces what you learn and you're much more likely to take action on it and actually absorb it. Um, I listen when I'm sitting in traffic or when I'm just in the house, when I'm at the gym working out. You can download the books to your mobile device and listen anytime, anywhere. And they've got an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news and comedy. It's really your best source for everyday entertainment and the app makes listening a breeze with features like chapter navigation and narration speed control. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. 
Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Troll for those of you with short attention spans who want to listen on 2X, much like myself. And you can even share excerpts with friends from these audiobooks. Uh, not only that, like I said, you can access your books and shows anytime, anywhere, right from a smartphone or a tablet. So join Audible today and explore the world's leading provider of audiobooks, all beautifully performed by talented actors and narrators. Start a 30-day trial and download your first audiobook for free. So go to audible.com slash unmistakable to get started. Again, that's audible.com slash unmistakable for a 30-day trial and a free audiobook. This episode is also sponsored by Design Crowd. So I've been telling you uh, in the last few episodes that we all have a zone of genius, uh, a time when we're actually at our best, where we do the highest value work, where we do the highest quality of work, where things are really easy for us. And sometimes something like design is not in our zone of genius. In fact, when you do work out of your zone of genius, you're doing a disservice to your business. And so that's why it makes sense, uh, especially if design is not in your zone of genius, to outsource it. And that's where a service like Design Crowd comes in because they make the equivalent of an entire creative team accessible to you at a price that's affordable to anyone. And you have to remember, design is really the first impression that you make on any customer. It's the the thing that they judge you by. You know, no matter how much we say we don't judge a book by its cover, when it comes to design on the web, we absolutely do judge a book by its cover. It you know makes people take you seriously or not. So here's how Design Crowd works. You submit your project to Design Crowd. Um, you'll get anywhere between 60 to 100 submissions for your project. If you like what you get, you can approve payment. If not, you can go back to the crowd um, and ask for more. Uh, I, what I would recommend is that you try it out, uh, especially because unmistakable creative listeners are getting a hundred dollars off their first project. Uh, so visit designcrowd.com slash creative and use the promo code creative for a hundred dollars off. Well, I think that <clears throat> makes a, a really perfect setup to start talking about, uh, you know, what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about, which is this whole idea of inventing point B and, you know, the framework for it. So let's start kind of at where it comes from and then go through sort of the entire framework of it. Great. So um, the idea of inventing point B is uh, kind of a generalized way of thinking about art as a process in any area of life. So when you think about a work of art, I think you usually, you know, what comes to mind is a painting or a sculpture or a highly conceptual object in the corner of a museum that you kind of puzzle over. And the idea of art in, in this book is much more general. It's a kind of Swiss Army knife definition of art. And the idea is that if you're making a work of art, you're creating something new in the world that changes the world to allow itself to exist. Um, this comes from a Heidegger essay from 1947 called um, The Origin of the Work of Art. It's a rather impenetrable read. I, I you're welcome to try to read it. I assigned it for class once and definitely got some blank stares, uh, myself included. Um, but the idea, so if you just kind of think about that, uh, work of art is something new in the world that changes the world to allow itself to exist. Um, what that means is that the context you're making something in, the world itself is different when you start and when you end. So you're not just going from point A to point B, kind of within a, a static known world. You're in the point A world, figuring out how to lead from questions and risk developing things that are kind of unknown as to whether they'll succeed or fail. And that if they succeed, you have created a point B world. You've made something that then changes the world to make space for itself um, in, in a very small or a large way, these don't have to all be grand gestures, just kind of acts of, um, you know, putting a dent in the universe, as, as the saying goes, of, of trying to kind of affect, affect change or show up in a way of consequence in your personal life, in your professional life, kind of in the world in general. So I guess the, the, the first question that comes is, how do you navigate uh, the journey from you know, point A to an invented point B when there is so much uncertainty built into it uh, from sort of a psychological and emotional perspective. Right. No, absolutely. Um, and I have to say, Srini, reading your book, I am really struck by how much you delve into the emotional and psychological aspects of kind of needing validation and, you know, wanting to make sure you're doing something that's good and certain and all of that. Um, so 
the the framework of the book there there are these seven steps of art thinking and the the first ones have to do with exactly what you're talking about like kind of getting comfortable in the psychological space of creation and then the later steps are really about how to do that in a kind of skillful way relative to the fact that the market economy is the context that we all live in so the starting point is that um First of all, you kind of zoom out and think about what you're trying to do in the much larger ecosystem of your life, uh, which is a, a little bit of a risk management decision and a little bit of just a kind of mindset shift. So instead of focusing on the one thing you're working on, you see that in the context of your larger life and you make some decisions about how much to devote your time and energy to it. So Maybe you have a little bit of time you can afford to lose. Maybe you have a lot of time you can afford to lose. And you just choose that and get started. And then um, I think the biggest psychological piece is that, you know, to me, there's a very strong cognitive bias in how we see our own creative projects uh, when we try to compare them to other people's. Because you tend to see other people's work after they've finished it when it's in the world. And then you, you tend to see your own in the before picture when it's messy and in progress and, you know, the bumper of your car is held on with duct tape, so to speak. I, by the way, I feel that way all the time. Um, and I think it's important for us to talk to each other about that and to show the vulnerability of that. Um, but I also think, you know, you can sort of take a philosophical approach and understand that you know, we're not even our own best judges of what's a success or a failure. And just to kind of keep putting one foot in front of the other. And the the main navigational tool is uh, what in the book is called a lighthouse question. So again, if you're inventing point B, you can set goals and milestones, but they tend to be somewhat process-based. Like I will show up for practice every day or I will work on this project every Thursday, um, much more so than outcome-based because you often aren't sure if something is possible. You're asking this big question of possibility. Like, wouldn't it be cool if you know, I could run a sub four-minute mile or take this building and turn it into a massive art center. And then you're working toward that, but in more of a directional lighthouse way than a kind of definite outcome way. And so I think being clear on the question and then being clear on the amount of time um, are the sort of basic forms. And just to put that uh, in a story context, um, there, there are many people in the book in many different fields who kind of have this sort of um, kind of set up to, to what they've accomplished. But um, one who comes to mind is Sir Roger Bannister, who uh, in May of 1954 was the first person to run a mile in under four minutes uh, at Ifley Road Track at Oxford uh, in England. And that sounds a lot like he met a goal, right? He said, I'm going to do this, and he met a goal. But I think what you have to imagine at the time that's a, a little bit subtle is that People thought it was a law of nature that no one could run that fast. Um, the world record had sat at, you know, between one and two seconds over four minutes for about nine years. And some of that is situational because uh, international sporting competition had been so deeply disrupted by World War II. And there were probably people before that, I'm thinking particularly of Louis Zamperini, who was the subject of the book Unbroken, who, who might have run a sub four minute mile um, had the war not happened. Um, but in, in Bannister's case, uh, what I find so beautiful about his story is that it's a few things altogether. Like he had to actually believe it was possible before he did it. He had to, to attempt to imagine that he could run a sub four minute mile. And he wasn't a professional runner. He was an amateur who, a gentleman's amateur, as it was called at the time in Britain, who was actually training to be a neurologist. So he was a resident in neurology, and he had it exactly timed to go on his lunch break to the track and run his workout, eat a sandwich, and then get back on the floor of the hospital in an hour. And so that was his studio time practice. That was the amount that he could commit to it. And he also had given himself um, what in the book is called defining a grace period. He, he had had a um, 
really difficult time uh, competing in the Helsinki Games in 1952. And he said, you know, I'll, I'll just give myself two more years. At some point, my full-time medical work is going to make this not possible, but I'm giving myself a grace period of working on this for two years. And he also accomplished it working really closely with his his um, very close friends, uh, Chris Brasher and Chris Chataway, who were astoundingly good runners in their own right. Um, one uh, co-founder of the uh, London Marathon and the other a world record holder himself. And so it's sort of beautiful story. Um, but the part that really strikes me the most is that Bannister did this. I mean, he converted what he was imagining into actual demonstrated fact. And then after nine years of no one breaking the record, he only held the record for 45 days before someone uh, bested his effort. And there are a lot of people, three runners in particular, who were trying for that sub four minute mile at the time. So maybe it's just a, a factor of timing. But I always think that, you know, there's this kind of thing that happens in any area of life where there's a there's a very large, if almost invisible, gulf between believing something's possible and doing it and then seeing that it's demonstrated and doing it a little bit better. And kind of inventing point B is the kind of uh, doing it in the void of not being sure it's possible. And then there's a kind of incremental improvement that happens from there that's that's important. That's important in tuba playing. It's important in product development um, in so many areas. But I really kind of want to honor that space, that, like, that very human imaginative space of working that hard for something where you're not sure it's going to happen. Um, and, and navigating just back to your original question, navigating from like a clarity of what it is that you hope for and then a kind of skillful way of managing risk so that you can attempt to do the extraordinary within the realities of a kind of ordinary life. So <clears throat> you talked about sort of the, the first step being one of the psychological pieces. So let's get into all seven steps kind of um, and walk through the framework of the whole thing. Okay, great. So um, this will probably be like that thing when you're in college and you're taking four classes and you can only remember the titles of three of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I'm kidding you. Um, right. So the first step is um, to uh, take a wide angle view. And that means that um, you want to trade looking at the object for looking at the environment. So economics is a a kind of object-based science. Um, you're making a widget, you're making it faster. And a lot of creative breakthroughs, and it's one of my favorite stories in the book, is uh, this guy called Thomas Fogarty, who invented the balloon catheter, um, not because he was a storied surgeon, he, which he later became, but because he was a self-professed juvenile delinquent who had to be either busy or supervised, got a job at a hospital, and then figured out a medical riddle based on the fact that he used to cut school to go fly fishing, and he knew how to tie knots really well. So sometimes if you zoom out to this wide angle, you realize that some of the most important breakthroughs happen from your whole person or your whole life, um, not just from a head down focus, just on the problem at hand. So that's step one. Um, step two is acknowledging when you're in the weeds. So that's that idea of the cognitive bias that I, I might compare what I'm working on to something that someone else has already done, and I might get paralyzed and feel like I can never do it because theirs looks so perfect. So it's it's a small example in the book, but I think it kind of encapsulates the feeling that I was at a wedding once and the toasts were so effusive and the couple seemed so in love that I turned to my friend and I said, gosh, I can't imagine that ever happening for me. And he turned back to me and goes, you know, she didn't go out with him the first time he asked. And I feel like that is the nature of creative process, that it just, the outcome always you know, is tr it's transformative, and so it doesn't look like where you started. So you zoom out and see the whole, then you kind of accept that you're in the weeds, and there are a lot of tools in the book for kind of discernment as opposed to judgment and kind of how to frame that productively to move forward. Um, some of it has to do with mindfulness and attentiveness. Um, and then the third is defining your question, so your lighthouse question. Um, in the Roger Bannister sense. And then the fourth is recognizing that you have to make some risk decisions based on that. So um, you have a portfolio of income and a portfolio of activity, and you want to make decisions that keep you supported and in balance in the short term. And you want to manage for risk, not just that you'll fail, but also risk that you'll succeed. So you want to make sure you own some of the upside 
Uh, I'm, I'm a huge proponent of owning royalties or equity shares. Um, and there's a discussion of how that happens in relation to intellectual property. Um, and then the next framework is really how to do all these things, not just as an individual operating in a vacuum, but in an organization with other people, sort of in the fray. And uh, a couple of the tools there are about how to assign different roles or seek out different forms of support. So for example, there's an idea of a colleague friend who is a person who can kind of relate to you with the warmth of friendship, um, but who's also in your field. There's a very beautiful story of these artists, um, Solowit and Eva Hesse, who are um, extremely close friends in a way that kind of affected um, each, each of their work, uh, artworks and and they also collaborated. Um, and then this idea of a producer, which is assigning a role that's a kind of secondary creative role. So you have the work itself, but it's make or break to be able to commercialize the work. And so you can think of commercialization as a secondary creative form, and that's the role of the producer. So the producer's job is to make it happen under budget because otherwise it won't happen at all. And you see that a lot in film. You see it a lot in uh, social entrepreneurship. And, and in both of those cases, if the budget doesn't work, the project doesn't work. Um, and there are lots of examples there from Pixar and other films and um, you know, cook stoves in the developing world. Um, and so if you imagine the next shift in mindset is from uh, the producer who can commercialize something to um, designing the commercial structure itself. So the producer kind of makes the project fit into the letter of the business model. And then you can think of the next step as building the business model itself. Um, and in that sense, I think, you know, capitalism is itself a design medium and it has certain strengths and weaknesses. Um, certain th- it's kind of like oil paint. It's a beautiful medium. You can achieve great luminosity with paint. It also dries very slowly. Um, and so you're kind of making these trade-offs and you're designing around the things that are constraints of the medium. Um, and then finally, you know, the last question is, is part and parcel of the first question of the book. Um, the last question is... Uh, is really, um, so if you think about one of the greatest artists of all time, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, um, I I like to ask people, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, Srini, um, if he were alive today, what would he be doing? Like, would he be uh, smoking a cigarette outside an art school, or would he be in a mock turtleneck pitching a product on a stage? And um, I think that, you know, there's so many answers to it, um, but what really... uh, kind of sticks out for me as a kind of final framework of the book is is, um, how different his circumstances were economically and educationally, that he worked at a time of patronage, so he had funding ahead of time, and he also, you know, worked at a time where he could um, operate at the frontier of his own knowledge um, and have that run tangent to the frontier of everyone's knowledge and that he could be expert in all these different fields. So the, the tools that arise from that are these, these kind of um, realities of the necessity of conversation across fields, that the amount of information and data in the world has proliferated massively at the same time that all of our pathways through it have narrowed. And so there's more and more need for kind of connection across different fields. I'm sure that's my middle child talking. And so I think the the last tools in the book have to do with kind of owning the necessity for specialization. I mean, all of us have finite bandwidth relative to what's available to do and to become in the world. Um, But to to feel that you can define your own specialization and to define your own metaphor, um, not to have to slot into an existing category. And then from that, find ways to connect with other people. Um, So I I think taken all together, it's a sort of arc of uh, systems thinking um, and independent thinking. And then these, there, there are many more kind of detailed tactical tools. Um, I'd like to think the approach is kind of practical and philosophical at the same time. This episode of The Unmistakable Creative is sponsored by HostGator. So I told you at the beginning of the episode that you should consider buying a domain at least if you do nothing else. It's a really simple first step. And uh, otherwise, you might find yourself like my business partner, Brian, who tried to buy the domain briancone.com because he let it go. And now he has to pay $1,000 to get it. 
to get his own domain name. So if you do nothing else this year, uh, one of the best things you could do to support the show, and not only that, to make some progress with your work or whatever creative project that you're thinking about starting, just buy yourname.com as a domain. And fortunately, like I said, our friends at HostGator can help you to get started with 30% off all their hosting packages. Uh, not only that, they're probably the most reliable hosting provider out there. They have amazing support. They'll stay on the phone with you for six hours if that's what's needed. So visit hostgator.com slash creative and use the promo code creative for 30% off. This episode is also sponsored by Chapman University. Chapman's located in Orange County, just 16 miles from the beach and a little over 30 miles from L.A., Uh, There are about 8,000 students enrolled in both undergraduate and graduate programs at Chapman. So that means the classes are super small. The student-to-faculty ratio is just 14 to 1, so you get a ton of personalized attention. They're best known for their programs in film and television, business, science and technology, education, health sciences, and the arts. And with 10 different schools and colleges and more than 100 different majors and programs, there's literally something for everyone. And if you're looking for things to do on or off campus, they have over 200 student clubs and organizations. And if you're looking to study abroad, they have dozens of opportunities, whether you're looking at a short trip or looking at an entire semester. And here's the best part. 86% of the students at Chapman benefit from some sort of financial aid. So you might not have to pay for all of it yourself. So if you're a student or you have a student who's looking at colleges, visit chapman.edu slash information to learn more. Again, that's chapman.edu slash information. Wow. Uh, So one other question about this, where do you think people go wrong uh, in this process and how can they prevent the mistakes that might occur? Um, yeah, it's such a great question. I mean, I, my, my own ethos is that there are not that many ways you can go wrong except to not try um, or to, you know, be arrogantly sure that you're right all the time. Um, I uh, have a friend who became a risk officer in a bank several years ago. And when he was going into the job, he said, you know, I'm actually quite nervous about this. Um, and I said, you know, it's, that's what you should be. You're a risk officer. It's your job to have doubt. I would only be worried about you if you didn't. And I think the same thing is kind of true with creative process. It's like we're all asked to be a little bit vulnerable and to um, be willing to risk looking like an idiot or um, wasting time. And, and just to sort of um, infuse everyday life with that feeling. It's not like you have to do this all the time. I mean, there's, there's a time and a place to just go from A to B and to be efficient and productive and get things done. Um, but ultimately, we need to devote time um, and space to kind of inventing the world that comes next in which we execute and get things done. Um, because if we don't do that, um, you know, we won't have agency to kind of show up in the world and bring to the world what, what each person is capable of. So speaking of capabilities, um, I want to wrap with, with two last questions. Do you think there are some people who are just inherently good at inventing a point B, or do you think that is sort of a skill that can be developed and learned? And is, you know, is that what you're really hoping to, to accomplish? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I'm an optimist and a skeptic. So I think that, um, when you don't know something, you, I always tilt toward possibility. So I, I don't know cognitively how the brain works for every other person in the world. Sometimes I don't know how my own cognition works. So I think that um, I believe that everyone is an artist, honestly. Um, I believe that everyone has um, deep wellsprings of creative potential and that there are many different reasons why we show up with that differently. And there's some people, you know, there's, I I, um, believe there's a lot of cognitive diversity and that that's very positive in the sort of symphony of how we all do things in the world. Um, But I think that some people, you know, certainly if you have a shaming experience around art in childhood, or even if you have a judgmental experience of any kind, uh, like if you're praised a lot, I think that can be just as paralyzing as being criticized. Um, And I think there also are a lot of um, very honorable forms of duty that people embrace that take them away from creative pathways. And there's some people in the book who have those stories where, you know, they they had a choice between um, law and art, and they chose law. And then as their life unfolded, they came to kind of embrace a, a kind of creative chapter later on. And I don't just mean kind of watercoloring. Um, I'm thinking of a woman uh, called Louise Fleurencourt, who's the first cousin of 
uh, the Southern writer Flannery O'Connor, who was in the first class of women at Harvard Law School, which I actually think is a form of inventing point B. But she chose that after having trained as an artist and being afraid that she would, you know, never have two pennies to rub together and um, not be able to live in the world as an artist. And then later in her life, she was asked to move to Milledgeville, Georgia, Flannery O'Connor's um, home, uh, to kind of oversee her legacy. And that became her bloom where, where you're planted creative project. So I think that, you know, everyone does have this potential. It manifests in different ways. It's an area of life where sometimes the thing we're most asked to do is to, to get out of our own way. Um, and that can be a process, like a real process of pruning back the kudzu. Um, but but I, I definitely very strongly believe that everyone has the capacity to be a creative and independent thinker. And that that is for me, like one of my greatest hopes just as a human being. And it's also one of my greatest hopes as a person who lives in a democracy um, that we cultivate that kind of independent thinking um, above all else, not just the capacity to have an opinion, but the capacity to keep thinking beyond that. Mm-hmm. Well, I uh, have one final question for you, which I know you've heard me ask. Uh, <laughs> what do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Yeah. You know, I think that um, it's a little bit related to what I just said, Srini, that what makes people unmistakable is always already there, that that we are all unmistakable in our own ways. And sometimes it means taking the risk to do that, to, to show up and to try something, because, you know, as you um, write about so well in your own book, um, it's very easy to see someone else be unmistakable and to think that you'll kind of copy that and try it out. And then you realize how little that works. Um, I've, I've had that experience when I first started teaching of being given people's teaching notes and trying them out and realizing how much that doesn't work. Um, so I, I really feel like being able to kind of sit with a little bit of clarity and focus about um, noticing the thoughts in your own mind and um, noticing with great love and curiosity the things that you notice during your day. It could be the way you notice that a revolving door isn't working properly. It could be the way you notice a dynamic in a meeting. It could be a way that you notice something that small children in your life are doing. It could be a moment of noticing that you're tired or energized by something. I think honoring those moments, kind of holding space for them, And then when those flickers of questions come up, the kind of wouldn't it be cool if questions or I wonder if this could be better or I wish this, kind of holding on to them, like the kite strings that they are and allowing them space to flourish uh, in the future. Awesome. Well, um, this has been really, really cool. Uh, I'm so glad Eric connected us because you just kind of packed this with so many really, you know, profound creative insights. Well, I um, I think I'll be secretly sad if the recording device doesn't fail and we don't get to talk again soon, Srini. But it's been it's been my sincere pleasure to uh, to be on. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that next time on the Unmistakable Creative. In you know what we call legit or legitimate musical theater training, you know you train the singing voice and. Then you look at the show or you look at the musical and you go, okay, what character am I? And what is my relationship with the other characters in the show? And when I sing this song, how do I embody this character and move this plot? And this is the general formula of legitimate musical theater. Sherry Sanders joins us to talk about creativity lessons from the world of musical theater.